Hello and welcome to the European Resilience Initiative Center video podcast. Today our guest is William Alberg. He is a director of strategy, technology and arms control at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, IISS. Welcome, William. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Uh, we have seen uh, recently a development, a new development in the relations between Russia and the West. Russia has left another treaty on uh, arms control. And is it a big deal after all what Russia has done? Is this treaty mean anything? Right. So this is the Commercial Armed Forces in Europe Treaty, which was uh, uh, negotiated at the end of the Cold War and came into force um, back in uh, 1990, 1992. Um, it was very important. This treaty was negotiated, it started with mutually balanced force reduction talks in 1973. NATO actually offered those talks all the way back in 1968 um, after the Harmel report um, indicated that the Allies should try to deter the Soviet Union and on the basis of deterrence to seek negotiations towards the solution of the political problem of the day, which was the unification of Germany. The big problem was that the Soviets had a huge overmatch in conventional forces. So at any moment, the Soviets could initiate a surprise attack in the center of Europe, overwhelm NATO, and conquer Western Europe. So the idea was, could we enter into talks to try to balance conventional forces in Europe? Now, those talks went from 73 to about 1989 before they stopped. In, in those talks, they actually came up with everything that became the CFE Treaty, all the notifications, the inspection regime. Uh, they even talked about aerial surveillance, which was later broken off and turned into the Open Skies Treaty. So it was incredibly important in trying to establish um, balance. So the CFE Treaty required both sides to eliminate capability that was important towards overmatch. So it was about battle tanks. But uh, William, yeah. if, I, if I may interrupt you here, I'm sorry for, okay. for being that rude, uh, but with what we have seen recently uh, with uh, the war which Russia has started in Europe and with all the uh, conventional forces Russia has uh, announced on the uh, border between Russia and Ukraine in early 22 and then launch a full-scale attack, uh, I come back like to my question. Does this treaty mean anything? This, this all the like, control and transparency and we are open, like between like there are like no secrets between our blocks and you can see what I do, what you do, and that makes uh, the world a safer place. Does it make any sense now when Russia says, uh, I don't care, I can start a war and bombard cities anyway? Right, right. I guess what I was trying to build up to is the fact that this treaty actually forced Russia to reduce the number of forces and to be very transparent. That's one of the reasons they got out of the treaty in 2007. They actually suspended, Russia suspended all of its participation in this treaty in 2007. So Russia hasn't given us that transparency down to the separated battalion, full transparency over where their battle tanks and armored personnel carriers and artillery, combat aircraft and attack helicopters. There's some transparency in the document, but less. And part of the reason that Russia wanted out of the CFE treaty was in order to be able to initiate surprise attacks. So exactly as you said, Russia hasn't been implementing the treaty since 2007. It actually greatly helped in the attack against Georgia because they didn't have to notify the movement of all the forces that were required. If we had CFE in place in 2014, Russia would have never been able to sneak all those battle tanks to the separatists in, um, or, or the, you know, the Russian forces in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. We know that they moved thousands of tanks and APCs in t to give them to the DPR and LPR, and LPR back in 2014. We would have been able to inspect those Russian bases where they were massing these forces on the Ukraine border. And we couldn't. And that's one of the, this is one of the benefits for Russia of not being part of the treaty. So actually, if the treaty had been in place, it would have been much harder for Russia to surprise uh, Ukraine in, in February 2022 as well. The treaty had a purpose, but like I said, Russia hasn't implemented it in 2007. So actually, allies are very, very late to the game in suspending the treaty now. Now, they, were, they had suspended it vis-a-vis -vis Russia in 2011, but they were still giving information to Belarus, which, you know, Belarus and Russia have a military treaty, the Union State Treaty. They have a common military doctrine. So we assume everything we're giving to Belarus was going to 
Russia anyway. Why were we giving this information away for free? And you know, that, so that gets to, to the heart of what you're saying before. NATO was complying with a treaty that Russia was not complying with. And it's only now on November 7th that the NATO alliance is finally suspending operation of the treaty entirely. But uh, it is not the first case when Russia uh, pulls out of the treaty. We have seen uh, this, uh, like the, the events before when Donald Trump, um, like after Russia has multiple times violated uh, like other treaties on uh, mutual arms control, uh, when he pulled out of uh, the, the nuclear, nuclear, uh, nuclear forces treaty, and uh, then Russia said, okay, like we don't care, we do the same. Uh, so you were uh, in observing of the uh, of the uh, uh, arms control problematic in Europe and worldwide for years, for decades, and you have seen like how this old uh, thing developed. Uh, is it like are we now somehow at the end point of a long road? Yes, yes. And, and this gets back to what you were saying before. Russia doesn't want to be transparent about its military forces. They want to be able to attack wherever they want, whenever they want. Uh, they have a deep suspicion of transparency. They don't want to give away any information. And they know that in the West, we are transparent. It's just part of our nature. We have open societies. You can travel around wherever you like. In Russia, that's much harder. So it is now Putin has asserted that it's in his interest to be able to do destabilizing things. But he correctly also estimated that the West wants arms control more than he does. So he's consistently been trying to violate treaties to see what he can get away with, to see what will give him in exchange for compliance or for staying in treaties. And that's why, as you mentioned, he systematically violated the INF treaty just to see what we were going to do. Would we react? And we proved that we loved the treaties so much we were willing to go so far until actually it was just at the end of the Obama administration when they announced a new strategy to put military pressure and political pressure um, on and economic pressure on Russia unless they complied. And Trump then carried that policy through and actually withdrew, which was the right thing to do. Russia was in material breach of the treaty. But this is the thing. We want arms control more than Russia. And so Russia tries to see, are we willing to give up on Ukraine for in exchange for the New START treaty? That's why Russia suspended New START. Were we willing to give up on the CFE treaty uh, in exchange for Georgia? And the answer was no. And so Russia went ahead and invaded Georgia. Russia is constantly trying to use these agreements because they know that we want them more than they do. So I think what we're seeing now is the collapse of all these agreements that the Soviet Union and Russia entered into back when they had more of a status quo interest. Now that Russia is a disruptive power, they want to rip up the rules-based order, they have no interest in status quo agreements like arms control treaties. So yes, I think uh, the OSCE, the Vienna document is next. Um, I think they're probably going to pull out of the Chemical Weapons Convention at some point. Uh, it remains to be seen whether they'll stay in the NPT Treaty and the IAEA. I think they think they can do more damage inside than from outside, so they might stay in those. But I do think we're going to see further erosion of, the, of all the rules that were created during the Cold War and in the aftermath of the Cold War because Russia's just not interested. I remember also as Russia, just before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, uh, they pulled out uh, of the of the treaty. It wasn't a treaty. It was a protocol uh, on usage of landmines. So Russia is not a, um, a uh, um, uh, is not a member of a tower convention which bans landmines, but Russia uh, took obligations on itself to uh, protect civilians during war conflicts like you 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 may not use landmines uh, extensively you may not uh, like you must uh, mark the minefields you may not use booby traps etc and russia just like left this treaty weeks before the uh, the full scale invasion uh, so they they really go one by one all the treaties and just uh, and just leave them just ju just um, just leave them saying okay we don't care that uh, that um that brings me to your uh, to your statement, which you have already done, that Russia uses these treaties or used these treaties as uh, as a leverage against us, and Russia wasn't transparent all the time. Uh, how was your job when you were in this uh, in this business, and you had like to observe what Russia is doing? Uh, like I try to imagine, like Russia is a huge country with a lot of military bases in very distant areas. When you come there and say, oh, we don't have any bad things here, like they're all gone, like we have destroyed them. And you know that something is not that right here. Like what was your daily business? So, right. I was at 
NATO for eight years as the director of arms control there and working with allies to try to verify arms control. And then before that, I was at the Pentagon as the um, uh, treaty compliance uh, officer for conventional arms control. And yeah, Russia was, I mean, look at the U.S. compliance reports uh, for arms control on the State Department website. It says right in there, Russia has never complied with the flank limits, for instance, in the CFE treaty. I mean, it just says right out, Russia, Russia was violating the CFE treaty from beginning to end. And the fact is, nobody really took it seriously. I used to make statements all the time, and I finally got NATO to actually make the statement. It was amazing. This section actually said, Russia has never conducted an observation under the Vienna document. And you say, okay, that sounds esoteric. I don't even know what that means. The Vienna document says that you have to invite all the other OSCE states to observe an exercise when it has more than 13,000 troops in it. Russia has never had a mandatory observation of any exercise from 1990 to the present. That means that Russia has never had an exercise of more than 13,000 troops. Now, Russian MOD says they have exercises of more than 13,000 troops all the time. And yet somehow, they've, it, this is part of the thing. Russia has been in non-compliance, but the West just says, nah, what are you going to do? They don't even call Russia out on non-compliance. Why do we expect arms control to have any effect if we don't take compliance seriously, if we treat it like it's some technical matter? It, to me, arms control is like an alarm clock. It's part of your intelligence indicators and warnings. The Vanda document itself says you're supposed to use it with national technical means, which is spying, which is satellites and all that kind of stuff. So you, you look at what Russia's doing, right, with your intelligence, and you say, okay, now let's look at their arms control information. Well, they're having a big exercise here, and they haven't declared it. Let's ask them, hey, what's happening here? And if they say there's nothing happening there, then that's a problem. You should treat that seriously. That means that Russia is doing something horrible. You've, they've just told you that there's intention. So you use intelligence plus arms control to divine intention. Now, if Russia legitimately made a mistake and said, oh, come on, let's fix this. I'm so sorry. What did we do wrong? Then you know, okay, there's probably nothing wrong here. But when, when they do what they've done for the past 30 years, which is to say, we're not violating any of these agreements, then you know that something's wrong. So in other words, arms control is an alarm clock. It's been going off for 30 years, and we keep hitting snooze, and then we blame the alarm clock for being broken. It's like, no, you ignored it. You ignored the warnings. The warnings have been there all along. Russia has not wanted to withdraw its forces from Eastern Europe. They still are occupying Moldova. And now they've taken two chunks out of Georgia, and they're trying to devour Ukraine. Like, what else has to happen here? Arms control has been the, the, the canary in the coal mine. It's been the alarm clock with the snooze button. We've been ignoring it, and then we blame, oh, you know, who could have, who could have known? Uh, Russia's behavior has been telling us everything we wanted to know, but we treated it like it was some esoteric, weird thing. Part of that's on us. Let's face it. The arms control community over the past 30 years has become this little closed priesthood that's really good at talking to itself and doesn't really explain what all this stuff means. And, and mainly because it didn't really want people to look in and say, wait a second, this is a disaster. What the hell is going on here? We have to get much better about thinking about arms control as, as I mentioned before, part of your military intelligence and warnings. We have to take violations very, very seriously and we have to be willing to take action when the other side is violating it. And that was the thing. We didn't have political will to take action. Nobody wanted to deal with Russia until finally in 2022, everyone finally agrees. In the meantime, the Baltic states are going, what, what else has to happen for us to finally take Russia seriously? Well, unfortunately, tens of thousands of Europeans have to die in a war. That was exactly my question, which I wanted to ask you. Uh, when it was clear that Russia does not comply, uh, uh, Russia does not comply, sorry, uh, was it the political will of the Western politicians to ignore it? Yes. 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 Look, look, look at the INF. Look at the INF crisis. Okay. Uh, U.S. intelligence all the way back detects that Russia has tested a missile that violates the INF treaty. How does the U.S. want to handle this? Oh, well, let's talk really quietly to the Russians privately and not tell anyone else. And you know, maybe Russia will say, "Oops, that was a mistake." All right, I, I get that. That. You get to do that once, maybe twice, but after like three years of trying that with Russia, where Russia says, not only did that test not happen, but the 9M729 missile, this is actually what Ryabkov told Rose Gottemuller, the 9M729, 9M729 missile does not exist in the Russian system. Now, I happen to work it for IISS right now. One reason why I work for them is because they came to my office one day and they said, hey, we found a request for proposals from the Russian MOD to build a transporter erector launcher for a new missile called the 9M729. Isn't that interesting? They actually found a newsletter for the retirement of a missile scientist congratulating him on developing the 9M729. So what I did 
at NATO was I put together all the open source references to the 9M729 and I gave it to the allies and they went, and they gave that to the Russians and the Russians went, oh, that missile. Oh, well, oh yeah, that missile. Oh, it exists. It's just not what you think it is. And it's like, come on guys. So it's, it's not a smoking gun. It's a smoking Gatling gun <laughs> uh, in both hands. Yeah. And uh, they just say, okay, it's not what you think. Wait, but here's the important thing. So, so up until we found the information in open source, the U.S. was telling the Allies in classified contexts that Russia had violated the treaty. And they were able to share, not at NATO headquarters, but directly really, really sensitive classified information with Allies intelligence services. At, but publicly, not all Allies were willing to say that they agreed that, that Russia was violating the treaty. Not because they didn't know. They knew that Russia had violated the treaty, but because they didn't know what happened next. They didn't know what to do. They didn't have consensus within the alliance to treat Russia like an adversary, like the adversary that Russia is. And so because they didn't know what happens next, they didn't have the political will to declare Russia as an adversary, to understand the implications of violating the treaty, and therefore they weren't willing to go to the next step. It was only after we were able to put this stuff out in the public sphere that allies suddenly developed the public will to say, oh yeah, this is a problem and we have to do something about it and we have to do something about it together. So, so you're absolutely correct. Up until that point, I would say the INF crisis was one huge step forward. Crimea was a step forward before that. Georgia, for some reason, was never a step forward for the alliance. I don't know why, but Crimea was the first step forward. INF was the second step forward. And then the February 2022 was the final step forward to make the allies wake up. But before that, you know, honestly, Russia had been getting away with murder and arms control for three decades. And, and it was because we didn't have consensus to treat Russia like an adversary. There were still allies that wanted to believe that Russia was a partner. Look at the NATO 2010 strategic concept. It is one of the most disastrous documents I've ever read in my entire life. This is after Georgia, and we're still, still treating Russia like a partner, a lover, a future member maybe. You know what I mean? It's nonsense. We, we refused to understand what was happening. And there was Putin telling us, I'm your adversary. I'm going to come and kill you. And we're like, no, 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 it's all fine. It's all fine. It's all fine. So you're absolutely correct. It's political will. They didn't want to see it. So, so again, arms control becomes a casualty of the lack of willingness to understand what, what the signal you're getting is. The signal you're getting is Russia is your adversary and they're coming for you. You don't want to believe that. So again, you just blame the tool. You ignore it. You sequester it rather than you take it seriously. And you say, they're coming for us. We got to do something about this. Why would they have 150,000 person exercise? And, tell you that it's actually 12,999 in Vienna. You mean that yeah. uh, exercises which took place in Belarus uh, in like Zapad, 2019 Zapad, but, 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 Zapad. But They also did snap exercises. They did Kavkaz. They did, they've done all these exercises. Starting around 2012, we'd start to see a big uptick in Russian exercises. And yet, that should be a huge signal when Russia is saying it's lying. The MOD makes a statement that says this is 150,000 troops. And then in Vienna, they say, no, it's 12,999 troops, so you're, you don't get to come and see it. That, that, what else do you need to, to tell you that something horrible is going on and that you need to prepare yourself? This drove me crazy. This was honestly just something at NATO headquarters that would just drive me nuts. But again, we didn't have political will. We finally do. The NATO 2022 strategic concept finally acknowledges that Russia really is our adversary and that we have to work very hard to defend ourselves. But, you know, um, all of us who are working on these issues, you know, I started working on these issues in about 2000. Before that, I was working on nuclear security. Um, but the alarm bells started going off really, really early. Russia, oh, man, I mean, they stopped withdrawing their troops from Moldova in what was that, 2003? Uh, they never uh, fulfilled the Istanbul commitments to withdraw their troops from uh, Moldova and from Georgia. Uh, this, this has just been a crisis in slow motion. And it, 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 it amazes me to this day. But fine. Here we are now. If arms control is going to have a role in the future, it has to be connected directly to hard security interests. The arms control community now has to prove that any agreement is actually enhancing our security and not giving um, uh, momentum and power away to the Russians. It's a huge burden that we've put on arms control by not treating it seriously. So now when people say, oh, I want arms control, it's like, well, do you mean the crappy kind of arms control that you guys were running in the 2000s? Or do you mean the good kind of arms control where we actually put it in with intelligence indicators and warnings where we actually can use it to make ourselves more secure? That's the big issue now for the future, whether arms control have, can have a role. It can, but do we have the serious people in place that are willing to use it in the way that it should be used. 
That is exactly the question which I wanted to ask you later. But before I do this, I remind everyone who watches, who is watching this uh, interview, don't forget to like this channel, to subscribe to this channel, to share. And if you have your ideas, comment under this video. We are talking to uh, William Alberg. He is a director of strategy, technology and arms control at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, IISS. He's a passionate arms control expert with decades of experience also working in Russia. And uh, we have talked already about how Russia violated uh, the treaties uh, before exiting, before leaving them. And um, if we talk about the future of arms control, you have already mentioned that arms control should be uh, of a different kind. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, were the treaties uh, which Russia used to violate before, were they somehow toothless? So we believed that if we enter into a treaty, then both sides have the common interest of reducing the, the, the tensions and making the world a safer place. But if one party, in particular Russia, wanted to use the treaty as a leverage against us, they misuse it. And in that situation, we didn't know how to react. Like, should we show teeth? But the, 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 the whole idea of the treaty was to make both sides toothless. So it was against our ideas. Uh, how can we use this treaty? Well, okay. So imagine if, well, all right. First of all, you're absolutely correct. And I'm glad you didn't mention the word trust because trust has nothing to do with arms control. Uh, I, I always encourage people to go back and listen to the Reagan speech that he gave when he said, trust but verify. The entire room bursts out in laughter because it's, it is a joke. It's supposed to be a joke. It's a Russian proverb. It means I trust you, but I still have to verify. In other words, I don't actually trust you at all. That's the point of arms control is I don't trust you. We don't have verification with countries that we trust. We have verification on things where we don't trust the other side and we need to see. So, so verification is a very important part of arms control. But ultimately, both sides have to have a common interest in something. What is that something? For conventional arms control, it would have to be that both sides want to avoid unintentional conflict. So if we're going to go to war, it's going to be because we decide to go to war or one side or the other decides to go to war. Not by mistake, we have a series of escalation and we don't really know how to get out of the es escalation cycle. Also, we want to prevent the other side from being able to mass forces unexpectedly. But again, if you're using it with intelligence, so you see forces massing, they haven't notified it. Okay, that tells you it's an invasion. If you go in and you ask for an inspection, they say you can't come and inspect there. Okay, then we know that it's something imminent bad is going to happen. That is effective arms control. Effective arms control is when, with intelligence, you can detect behavior that would break the treaty with enough time to be able to react. And that's what we weren't doing in the 2000s, is we weren't reacting the way we should have been reacting when Russia systemically violated arms control, is to take that seriously and to build up our forces to be able to defend ourselves. So an effective arms control treaty, first of all, would require Russia to not want unintentional conflict. But the thing is, Russia loves risk. They want to intimidate us. So they want to have large-scale surprise exercises on our borders so that we panic and then we start off so violating our violating our airspace all the time. Like they just routinely send their bombers and their fighter jets into our airspace. They just in two minutes they leave it, in five minutes they leave it, but they, they constantly check our reactions and they make it routinely normal. They normalize right. this violation. So at the tenth time, at the twentieth time, we if if we react, they will say, Okay, you have not reacted like nineteen uh, times before, why do you react now? Well, right. And that's why, you know, when, when they violate Finnish airspace, fin Finland right there with fighters, same thing with Baltic air policing, we have to be right there. Uh, that, that part, uh, that testing airspace, testing our resolve, I don't mind. We just then therefore have to show resolve. We have to be willing to intercept. We have to put, you know, be, be willing to put uh, not just air policing, but air defense. We have to be willing to fly these planes, not just to intercept, but, you know, with air-to-air -air missiles on board to make it clear to Russia that if they violate, if that if they choose to do any mischief, they may end up losing an aircraft. Uh, in that regard, I, I, I admire the Turks for shooting down the Russian fighter uh, years ago for violating its airspace. That's, I mean, they did exactly the right thing. You know, you keep violating our airspace, we're going to put your plane down. It's 
not it's not math. But for arms control, again, if Russia, and there may be a point where Russia becomes more of a status quo power, where they realize they stand to lose more than they gain. I think Finland and Sweden joining the alliance, for instance, finally allows NATO to defend the Baltics in a way that they couldn't before, because now from Finnish territory, you can fire attackums on Finnish high Mars uh, and destroy Russian forces massing on Estonia's border. Plus, Finland can you know, conduct a big exercise up by the Kola Peninsula and make Russia move forces up there so they can't mass as many forces uh, at the Baltics. I think at some point in that region, Russia will move towards status quo because, again, they have more to lose than they have to gain. At that point, they might want arms control. But we would have to design an arms control agreement based on war plans, based on what do we think they're going to do 30 days or 60 days or 90 days before, and how can we make sure that we tie those notifications to intelligence, where if they're not notifying, then we know that we have to start up our own war engines, that we have to prepare to defend ourselves. We have to deny them the ability to do whatever bad stuff they're going to do, whether it's an attack or whatever. So you can see that arms control could be designed in such a way that it provides earlier warning to take the option for Russia of a surprise attack off the table. But it would have to be tied directly to war plans. It would have to be tied directly to military intelligence. And that's something that a lot of the allies have not been very good at over the past 30 years, is to make sure that arms control is one of the hardest tools that you have in your intelligence toolbox, and to take it seriously and have the political will then to say, okay, Russia just, you know, didn't notify that they're moving these troops. We see that they're moving these troops. We're going to have to call up. Let's do a surprise exercise on the Russian border just to wake them up and tell them that we see what's happening here. And then communicate directly. We believe you violated this agreement. Prove us wrong. And in the meantime, we're going to put these troops here just as a precautionary measure. That's how arms control should function. But that's a different mindset than we've had for a long time. That was the original mindset for the Mutually Balanced Force Reduction Treaty and the CFE Treaty. It wasn't to make us toothless. It kept us actually at a level where near where we had, near our ceiling. But the Soviets had a lot more. And so the idea was to bring them down to our ceiling. So that actually would help us tremendously because it would force the Soviet Union to give up the idea of overmatch. So again, you could see an agreement where we decide first, what do we need to defend ourselves? Tell me exactly how many troops, how many tanks, etc. Okay, that should be the ceiling. Not under that, so that it takes away your ability to defend yourself, but the amount that you need to defend yourself. And then you tell Russia, you can't exceed that. And that way, again, it prevents them from building overmatch. That's how you design arms control. You take away their ability to launch a surprise attack that beats you. But again, that, that's just a different mindset than we've had for such a long time. And it would require something like the German peace studies uh, field to actually move into war studies. If you really want arms control, you have to understand war, not I, – I, I don't need somebody who understands treaties but doesn't understand war planning at all. It, it's just not useful. You need to understand conflict in order to understand arms control and to propose effective arms control. And it has to be tied to military plans in order to punish the adversary uh, should they violate it. But that uh, reminds me on this gap between the knowledge of experts who said like how it works and how the like, game theory works and how the Russians understand what is win for them, like they were ready to accept Uh, some some losses, yeah. some casualties, but if the uh, if another party loses more, they think that it is this party is after all a win because in the next round, in the next iteration of the game, uh, the Russian position will be uh, comparably stronger to the one of the adversary. So they are not interested in win win game. They're not in, even interested in zero sum game. Uh, they can even accept negative sum game yeah. if the losses of the adversary are larger than their ones. Yeah. And we, we know that the, the politics, especially in Germany, was extremely uh, like ignorant, I would say. And I remember how, the Germany's, uh, how Germany's president, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, called the NATO, uh, the NATO exercises in Baltics Uh, war mongering while we were talking about like some hundreds of troops strengthening uh, uh, Latvia and uh, like providing some signal of our commitment to our Baltic allies. But the head of the German state called it war mongering and provoking of Russia. What could be uh, what could be worse in in in, in the NATO uh, commitment? You're absolutely right, and and honestly, Frank Walter Steinmeier 
owes Germany and the NATO alliance an apology. He owes them an apology. He should, and I'm going to say this directly, uh, and if he wants to get mad at me and call me up, feel free. I'll uh, welcome the conversation. He needs to say I was wrong because he was wrong. And I think he knows he's wrong. And I think the German, uh, you know, larger political sphere now understands how wrong the stuff he was saying was. The only way to stop Putin from attacking, the only way to limit Russian bad behavior is to stand up to them. Those exercises were a small down payment on a much larger bill that Germany owes the Baltics in terms of defending them. I'm glad that they've committed a brigade to Lithuania. That needs to be permanent stationing with accompanied posts with German families. They owe the Baltics. The entire NATO alliance made it the world's problem to reunify Germany during the Cold War. West Berlin could not be defended. We had three brigades, the, the UK, US, and French brigades in uh, uh, West Berlin. Their job was not to win. Their job was to die so that the Soviets would have that choice of killing troops from the three nuclear weapon states in the NATO alliance. It would make them think twice. It was a tripwire. Uh, so we were risking all of our lives for an undefendable city as part of a war that we might lose, all in order to unify Germany. Germany now owes the Baltics. And for German politicians to say, oh, we can't defend the Baltics, it's too hard. We could never defend Berlin. You don't get to say that we, don't, we could never defend the Baltics. You need to put your blood on the line. And they need to fulfill that promise. And they need to fulfill it in a way that is demonstrably securing the alliance's borders. And, you know, I'm glad they've made the commitment, but I need to see actual troops. I need to see armor. I need to see them exercising. I need to see rules of engagement that show that they're taking this seriously, that it is part of the defense plan. Sakir, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, has declared that he has now established Sakir's AOR-wide plan for the defense of the alliance, the SASP. Great. That's going to have actual commitment, force commitments that Germany is going to have to fulfill and that right now they're not capable of fulfilling. They don't have the military forces capable of fulfilling Sakir's plan. Zeitenwende is risking complete collapse. Germany needs to fulfill its defense requirements for the alliance. They need to take its pledges to Lithuania seriously. They need to deliver. And the first thing I would love to see is for Frank Walter Steinmeier to say, you know what? I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Here's why I got it wrong mirroring projection. We were, we were assuming they thought the same way that we did. We were wrong. I am so sorry, but let's move forward. I would, I would thank him personally. I would, I would lavish him with praise if he was willing to say that I was wrong. But until he does, the man has absolutely no credibility. And all the people who criticized NATO for doing the bare minimum to defend itself over the past 20 years, uh, who, were, who were willing to throw out terms like warmongering and stuff like that, they, they, they need to acknowledge their mistake and move on. I, I, I will not beat them up if they apologize. If they really say, "All right, here's what I got. It, here's why I got it wrong," uh, but now I understand. Let's move on. So, yeah, Steinmeier. Uh, that's one particular thing that just infuriates me. He 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 owes us all a big apology. And quite frankly, uh, the the Steinmeier uh, proposal. What was it called? The um, uh, he created a, a parallel group to negotiate in secret on conventional arms control uh, because he wasn't happy with NATO not giving him everything he wanted. Uh, uh, that man, that man needs to get up there and, and tell us why he got it wrong and apologize, and then we can all move on. Can we hope that not only Frank Walter Steinmeier but uh, the whole German political elite, which is still pretty reluctant in supporting Ukraine and especially in fighting Russia, uh, that they can really change their mind uh, strategically, not just talk about Zeitenwende, but fulfill Zeitenwende? I, look, I think Pistorius is doing everything he can. Um, I but I mean, the problem with the German military system right now, and, and I think Baerbock is doing a great job, and I think a lot of Germans have woken up and have started to change their mind. And, and you're right, they could do more, but uh, you know, let, let's, let's acknowledge how far Germany has come. Um, but the real problem is that German procurement is broken. The, the German military system is broken and needs fundamental reform. And the idea that we can change things by a couple percentage points here, we can clean up a couple things there, uh, is not true. 
they need to re rethink everything from the ground up. They have built a system designed for sclerosis, designed for poor decisions, designed for slow rolling, and it needs complete reform, legal reform, uh, um, procurement reform, doctrine reform, everything, bottom to top, training, exercises, everything. How do we do that? That's going to require the Bundestag. That's going to require fundamental legal reforms to Germany's uh, entire MOD setup. The entire Bundeswehr needs reform. And that's going to require a much heavier lift than one speech by Scholz. And so far, we haven't seen the political will to carry that through. But uh, that's part of the reason why I'm in Berlin is to try to work with the Bundestag to try to convince them that they need to reform, that we need to change fundamentally the German approach to security policy. And uh, it's going to be hard. Uh, but, you know, look at Sweden. Sweden's done it. Um, FOI uh, wrote a series of reports for the government on the fundamental reforms that need to happen in order for Sweden to reestablish a heavy land force. Uh, and they've done it. A cross-party agreement to do it. Uh, they're doing a great job. So there, there is hope. Germany needs to be a little bit more humble and look around and not say, we're pretty good. We just need to be a little bit better. No, they need fundamental reform. And if they come in it with real humility and really try to change from the bottom up, then they can and they should. But will they? I don't know. Wow, uh, that is uh, what, of course, we all think about. Can we create, after Ukraine wins this war, uh, can we create a stable peace for Europe, a stable peace for transatlantic uh, society, a, space, a, a stable peace for the world? Uh, we don't know what will happen around, uh, around Taiwan next month, mm -hmm. next year. We don't know what will happen in the Middle East. Uh, the world will not turn into a safer place, quite the opposite, and we need to be uh, prepared to protect our peace and, and our freedom. Uh, it was William Alberg. He is a director of strategy, technology and arms control at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, IISS. Thank you, William, for this extremely moving uh, interview with a lot of deep insights. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe. Uh, you may leave your comments under this interview. Thank you once again, William, and see each other uh, later at the new interviews. I hope so. Thanks. <laughs>